كتاب الله دستوري وخير الخلق أسوتنا والحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يوم يبعثهم الله جميعا فينبئهم بما عملوا أحصاه الله ونسوه والله على كل شيء شهيد رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين Allah Azza wa Jalla in the Qur'an on multiple occasions make ref- makes reference to the fact that He teaches us. Not only that He revealed to us, not only that He informs us, but specifically that He teaches us. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهُ عَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنِ مِرَارًا Multiple times Allah Azza wa Jalla makes reference to the idea that Allah is teaching us. And teaching is different from telling someone something. A teacher spends a lot of time with a student. A teacher cannot say something once and expect that the student completely, completely understands and is now ready to be tested. A teacher has to actually repeat himself often, and the more important lessons, the ones that are going to be a bigger part of the test, they're going to be repeated more. And the things that you need to hear one time, and the teacher knows if I just say it once, you'll get it, and you won't forget, he says it once. In other words, a teacher's job is not just the delivery of information, but the instilling of understanding. And that part of that job is to actually emphasize certain things and de-emphasize certain things to give the student the right sense of proportion. Some of you in the audience are students. And you know that your teachers sometimes give you main assignments for your semester, a, a, you know, a, a, a term project. And on the other hand, you sometimes have extra credit assignments, some extra credit work. And you as a student understand the difference in priority. What takes precedent over what? As a matter of fact, if there's a limited time to talk to you, then the teacher will emphasize what is most important. Like the day before an exam, your teacher is not going to talk to you about the extra credit stuff. That's for easier times. The day before the exam, he's going to go over the main concepts that are going to be tested. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal gave us this final message, his book, that he says he taught us. And many of you are familiar, unlike the non-Muslims, we appreciate the repetition in the Qur'an. Allah Azza wa Jal repeats many things, many, many times over again, but actually each one of them is a teaching opportunity. If it was simply about information, if that's the only thing, that is the purpose of this Qur'an, that it's to deliver some information, then Judgment Day would be talked about once, not hundreds of times. Taqwa would be talked about once, not hundreds of times. If the only time you had to read, you just hear about the story of a Prophet one time, alayhi salam, whoever he may be, and it's done. You can go make reference to that, those few ayat again. He doesn't do that, he repeats himself. Because he knows that's what a student needs. I'm in the profession of teaching, and many of you in the audience, not only are you students, some of you are teachers. And you understand that in the profession of teaching, repetition is key. Review is key. And so Allah Azza wa Jal even says, as in the position of him teaching, وَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَ Remind. For the reminder serves benefit. So this message is, you know, it's revealed over 23 years, which is actually no time at all. It's no time at all considering that these 23 years are supposed to be guidance for humanity until the day of judgment. For all nations and all people across all cultures and all civilizations. There are only these 23 years to communicate what needs to be taught from Allah. Through the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa So time is of the essence. Every word counts. Every lesson counts. Every lesson is essential because it's supposed to be timeless. 
Now within the curriculum that Allah Azza wa Jal gave us, the educational curriculum that He gave us, the guidance that He gave us is the surah. Each surah of the Qur'an is actually a speech, a lesson taught by Allah Azza wa Jal Himself. And so what happens oftentimes is that we understand an ayah, but we lose sight of the fact that it's part of a lesson. It's part of something Allah taught, a larger surah. And that's one, kalam marbut. You know, mutanasib, everything is connected with everything. It's part of one speech. And so just like in any other speech, if you hear one part of the speech, and you don't know where this came from, you don't know what was said before it, and you don't know what was said after it, you can come to very different conclusions. And so the, the ayah I want to share with you actually is the sixth ayah of Surah Al-Mujadila. And in this surah, Allah Azza wa Jal makes reference, يَوْمَ يَبْعَثُهُمُ اللَّهُ جَمِيعًا فَيُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا عَمِلُوا أَحْصَاهُ اللَّهُ وَنَسُوهُ وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَهِيدٍ The day on which He is going to gather them. Of course this is, or raise them rather. This is of course a reference to Judgment Day. And Judgment Day Allah talks about hundreds and hundreds of times in the Qur'an. This is just one of many hundreds of times. And He says the day on which Allah will raise them. فَيُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا عَمِلُوا Then He will inform them thoroughly, exhaustively, of the things that they used to do. This is something we all know already. He adds something more though this time. He says, أَحْصَاهُ اللَّهُ وَنَسُوهُ أَحْصَاهُ اللَّهُ وَنَسُوهُ Allah completely recorded everything they did. And they had forgotten about it. Allah adds this new dimension to the conversation about Judgment Day in this ayah, saying that on Judgment Day, Allah will be telling us in great detail the things that you and I used to do. And we will, when we hear these things, our reaction is going to be, wait, I did that, I forgot that I even said that. I forgot that I even did that. that was, was that even a big deal? There's going to be so many things, and there are so many things you, I, you and I do on a daily basis. Things we say, things we do that we don't think are a big deal. And the only day we're going to find out that it was in fact a big deal is on the Day of Judgment. Because you know what? Small things, we forget. Big things, we remember. You know, when I used to live in New York, a lot of my friends in college were student visa. And when they got their jobs after job fairs, they applied for a H1 visa or whatever. And the date that they get for their appointment at the immigration office, they never forget. You don't forget the immigration date. You could forget the day you had to turn in a homework assignment, that's fine. You could forget you had to, you know, make a payment to the electricity company. Yeah, that's fine, you forget those things. But the immigration appointment, no way. Wedding day, no day, no way you forget the day you're getting married. You, you count the minutes down, you count the seconds down. There's a sense, people that are going to Hajj count the days, it's important. They don't forget, it doesn't leave their mind. So you know what, what leaves our mind are what is relatively insignificant. On Judgment Day you and I find out some things were insignificant to us, but not insignificant to Allah. They were a big deal to Allah. This is the sixth ayah. He says here, وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَهِيد Which is also really important. Allah is a witness over every single thing. Allah is witnessing everything you and I do. But you know what? Unlike all the other places in the Qur'an when Allah talks about Judgment Day, this is actually particularly part of a conversation. And we cannot lose sight of the fact about wh wh where the conversation began. So I want to give you some perspective. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina is sitting in the company of Sahaba and a woman walks in, her name is Khawla Ibn Ashur rahimahullah in At-Tahrir wa Tanweer says either Khawla or Khuwayla فَهُنَاكَ اسم تَصْغِيرْ كَذَلِكْ يُمْكِن So regardless, let's just say her name is Khawla, she walks in, she starts crying She says she had a fight with her husband Her husband got upset about something And he got so mad at her That she said from today on, you are like my mother Now that was a common thing for Arabs to say before Islam and the point of it was, I'm breaking up with you. And I won't ever think about you again. Because thinking about you is the same as thinking about my own mother. So this was worse than any divorce. This is what they used to do. And this would be like, you know, Al-Qawlu Fasil. This is it. I said it, that's it. From today on you're my mother, I cannot go back on my word. Because for the Arab, going back on his word is going back against his pride. So now he said it, so he can't, even if he feels bad about it later, he's not going to go back. Because this is, now it's between the love he has for this wife and his pride. And his pride will always win. For the Jahili Arab, it'll always win. Some of these practices are still carried on by the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu ajma'in, who haven't learned enough deen yet. So this is actually happening between a Sahabi and a Sahabiya. This man is a Muslim. But you know what? The, the practices of generations, they don't just disappear. It takes time. It takes time. 
This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when Allah describes how he develops the Sahaba, he describes him like a farmer. You know, فَآزَرَهُ فَاسْتَغْلَضَ فَاسْتَوَى عَلَى سُوقِهِ the, t- the ta'beer given, the expression given, the image given in Surah Al-Fatih is of slow development. People are being developed like crop is being developed. A seed does not turn into a full-grown you know, a crop overnight. It takes time. So Sahaba are still under development. This argument happens and this man says to his believing wife, this believer says to his believing wife, you are like my mother. Which she knows in their culture means they are no longer together. So she comes to him, crying, crying to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says he's done, this, this practice was called dihar you know, to be aggressive towards someone, to show them your back Now when he said this Rasul sallallahu or she, she came to him saying what should I do, give me some, you know, some, some solution لِأَنَّهُ أَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَيَّ I don't love anyone more than I love him I know he says crazy things sometimes but I still love him and he's the father of my children فَإِنْ ضَمَمْتَهُمْ إِلَيَّ جَاعُوا وَإِنْ ضَمَمْتَهُمْ إِلَيْهِ ضَاعُوا She says if you leave, if, if they're separated, then the kids have to go in either the father's custody or the mother's custody. So she says if you put them in my custody, they're going to starve to death because I don't make any money. But if you put them in his custody, they're going to die because he doesn't know how to take care of kids. You need both of us. So his family is broken. Ya Rasulullah, what should we do? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasul sallam. Given the situation, he doesn't know anymore, he just knows that according to that culture, it is considered a divorce, so his first response is harumti alayhi, you become haram for him. I cannot tell you more, because this is what the culture is at the moment. I don't know anything else. So she begs Rasul Wasallam, give me something else. Give me something else. And he said, ma indi laki shay. I have nothing for you. I don't have anything for you. And the Rasul Wasallam would spe- refuse to give her an answer. You know why he refused to give her an answer? Understand, for a judge to make judgment properly, a judge has to hear both sides. A judge cannot say, for until I hear both sides, you cannot go back. Harumti Ali suggests, until I hear both sides, you cannot go back. And the husband, maybe because of his pride or because he feels bad, he's not even going to come and ask. But until he hears both sides, he cannot say anything. But he's not saying anything and this woman is holding her little kids and she's getting angry. And she starts raising her voice to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She starts debating with him. She starts crying. And then she calls out on Allah, أَشْتَكِي فَاقَتِي وَوُجْدِي إِلَى Allah. I complain to Allah about my bankruptcy. I complain to Allah about what's happening to me. And when she complained to Allah, ayat came down. But before I recite these ayat, I want to share with you that there's another occasion that I want to compare this to in the life of our beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was in his apartment and some Muslims who had just become Muslim, al-a'rab, nusammihim al-a'rab. They came, these Bedouins came and they wanted to talk to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now we, you, you and I, when we say his name, we say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't even say Muhammad, we say Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But these Bedouins were not cultured yet. They were kind of Texan. So they came and they saw, they, they came outside the apartment of the Messenger والسلام, and they said, Ya Muhammad, ukhruj alayna. Muhammad, come out, we got, we got some questions. Yo Muhammad, we got some questions. That's, that's all they said. Now the Quraysh, who are kuffar, they have called him a liar. They have called him insane. They have called him a magician. They have called him all kinds of names. They have cursed his family. They've done much, much to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These men did not curse the messenger. They did not call him names. They called him by his name and his name itself is a praise. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad is an ism maf'ul from Hamada, which means the one who is highly praised or continually praised. But even then, because they raised their voice, ayat come down and the ayat say, وَلَا تَجْهَرُوا لَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ كَجَهْرِ بَعْضِكُمْ لِبَعْضِ أَن تَحْبَطَ أَعْمَالُكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ Don't you call him like you call each other? Don't you raise your voice calling him like you talk to each other? Hey, Kareem, how's it going? Hey, Ham- Hamid, what's up? No, no, not like that. Hey, Muhammad, we got some questions. No, 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 no. If you do that, all of your deeds will be taken away. And tahbata a'malukum wa antum la tash'urun. You won't even realize it. You cannot raise your voice in front of the voice of the Messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. La tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. Wa la tajharu lahu bil qawl. This is what we learned. Now, this woman. Coming back to the story of this woman, what is she doing? 
She's debating with the Messenger, والسلام, raising her voice, crying, screaming, debating. And the word jidal is used in the Quran when arguments are happening, happening between the believers and the kuffar. Jadilhum billati hi ahsan. When they engage with you aggressively, engage back with something better. This same word, now look at how Allah responds. He says, قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهِ Allah already heard the cry, the word of the woman that is debating with you. He's already heard it. قَدْ سَمِعَ قَدْ مَضَى What's, what does that suggest? It suggests Allah has been hearing her cries when she was in her home and her husband said that to her, to her and she started crying then, Allah heard that too. When she was walking over to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, crying along the way, he heard that too. And when she came and she argued and debated and raised her voice because she didn't know what else to do, because she was so emotionally overwhelmed, Allah heard that too. Allah is siding with this woman. Allah is siding with this woman. And he says she's complaining to Allah. وَاللَّهُ يَسْمَعُ تَحَاوْرَكُمَا And Allah, He's listening to both your conversations. And now the both of your conversations is interesting. It's a balaghi statement here. What does that mean? It means on the one hand, Allah is listening to the conversation that is happening between the Messenger والسلام, and this woman. But Allah is also saying, actually, Allah is also saying every husband and every wife that are having a conversation, Allah is listening. There's an iltifat. Allah is listening to every one of your conversations. And when you say something outrageous to your wife, Allah is listening. And Allah is hearing the, call, the cry of a woman who is being even verbally abused. Forget physically abused, that's a later story. Even if she's being verbally abused, Allah is listening. Even if you say something mean to her like you're so ugly, you're like my, you're, I don't want to look at you. Looking at you is like, like looking at my mother. You don't have to repeat those words that the Jahili Arabs say. You can come up with your own. You got plenty of your own to say. And if you say, Allah is listening. In the Allah, Allah Azza wa says, In the Allah, Sami'un Basir. Allah sees everything, hears everything, sees everything. Now, what happens next? Alladina yuzahiruna minkum min nisa'ihim. Those of you that have said this outrageous thing to their wives. This, what outrageous thing? You're like my mother. This was the cultural practice. If you've said this ridiculous thing to your wives, ma'hunna ummahatihim. Those are not their mothers. You can say whatever you want. You see, when people get emotional, they say things about cutting relationships. Like sometimes a mother says, from today you're not my son. Or the father says, from today you're not my son. Or a brother says to the brother, you're not my brother after this day. Don't ever call me again. I don't want to see your face. Or you're not my wife, or you're not my husband. What? Allah says, you can say whatever you want. They're still, your mothers are your real mothers. In ummahatuhum illa Their mothers are only the ones who gave them birth. Wa innahum layakuluna munkaram min al qawli wa zura. And no doubt about it, the people that are speaking, they are saying the most unacceptable, alien, you know, unusual thing, and the most horrible of lies. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَعَفُوٌ غَفُورٌ And no doubt Allah is ready to forgive, you know, pardon and forgive. Now these people who spoke this are getting in big trouble. I thought that when I read the first ayah, I thought this woman's gonna get in trouble. Because she's raising her voice to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But Allah does not need to hear only one side, He hears both sides. So unlike Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who only heard one side, Allah knows both sides. So He can pass His verdict. And He says the real criminal is the husband who said this ridiculous thing. And he's in big trouble. But Allah was ready to forgive him. Now the husband in the beginning of this ayah, by the time Allah says, you know, وَإِنَّهُمْ لَيَقُولُونَ مُنْكَرًا مِنَ الْقَوْلِ وَزُورًا Oh, they are saying some terrible things from their mouth. They are saying munkar and zur, Horrible lies. Unheard of things, evil things from their mouth. Now this Muslim, he's a Muslim. And he's Quran, ayat of Quran are coming about a Muslim, getting, making a mistake. He gets super scared. And then Allah says, no, no, but Allah is forgiving. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَعَفُونَ غَفُورٌ But how is Allah going to forgive him? How, what should he do to earn Allah's forgiveness? He says, الَّذِينَ يُظَاهِرُونَ مِن نِسَائِهِمْ Those who have taken this kind of lihar from their women, ثُمَّ يَعُودُونَ لِمَا قَالُوا Then they want to go back, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean it. Oh honey, come on, you know I get like that sometimes. It's not a big deal. It's just words, forget about it. They want to go back? Here's what you do. فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةٍ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَتَمَاسَى Then you better free a slave before you touch each other, before they touch each other. Freeing a slave in Islam is kafara for major sins. Freeing a slave is not something small. 
You do that when you've done a major crime. In the mind of the husband, he just ran his mouth, no big deal. But in the ju judgment of Allah, that is a big problem. You better go free a slave. ذَلِكُمْ تُعَذُونَ بِهِ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ خَبِيرٌ That is what you're being given counsel of. You want forgiveness? Go free a slave. Now you don't find a slave. I don't know where, I, I'm like, where am I going to free a slave from. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ Whoever couldn't find a slave. فَصِيَامُ شَهْرَيْنِ مُتَتَابِعَيْنِ And they should fast for two months. Consecutively. Two months without taking a break. You take a break, you start over. 60 days. مُتَتَابِعَيْنِ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَتَمَاسَّى Before they can touch each other. Okay, if you can't do that either. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ If you couldn't do that. فَإِطْعَامُ سِتِّينَ مِسْكِينًا So you should feed 60 poor people. So either you free a slave, or you fast for 60 consecutive days for running your mouth. Or on top of all of that, if you can't do that, you better feed 60 people. All of this because of a conversation that happened in the bedroom. It's not public. Now Allah knows in His wisdom. He knows all things that all people do. And when that woman came to Rasulullah wasallam crying and screaming, Allah Azza wa Jal could have revealed the answer to her question before she even opened her mouth. He could have. And there are plenty of stories in the Qur'an, in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, where Allah would know the revelation before the question is even asked. Before it's even asked. But in this case, like for example, I'll give you an example of that. When the Qibla was changed, the Messenger did not ask. He just looked at the sky. قَدْ نَرَى تَقَلُّبَ وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاءِ فَلَنُوَلِّيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا We saw your face turning to the sky, so we changed the Qibla. He didn't even ask. The ayat came before asking. So there are, but Allah Azza wa Jal planned that this woman should come. He planned that this woman should raise her voice. Allah planned that he should, everybody should hear that a woman that is in trouble because of the abuse and the psychological abuse of her husband, Allah is on her side. She may not think the system is on her side. She may think the husband is not on her side. So she is not in a position of power. But she has more backing than anybody else. Allah is backing her up. And the penalty has to be paid by the husband. Before I go on, I know my time's limited. I want to share something about just the, the, the wisdom of our sharia ah with you. In another place in the Quran, Allah Azza wa talks about people who make an oath. When you make an oath that you're going to do something and you want to break it. Like you promise Allah, Ya Allah, if you get me through this exam, I will pray Fajr in the masjid for 20 days. You, now you couldn't do it. When you can't do it, then you have to make up for it. That's called a kafara. When you make up for something bad you said, the kafara is, فَكَفَارَتُهُ إِطْعَامُ عَشَرَةِ masakin. Allah says in Quran, the kafara for making up for a nazar or an oath or a pledge you made to Allah or something you said that was ridiculous and you want to go back, you have to feed how many? 10 people. You have to feed 10 people. How many people you have to feed if you talk to your wife like that? 60 people. Now think about this. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, what do you do if you purposely break the fast? If you're fasting and you purposely broke the fast, maybe a husband and wife are not supposed to be intimate with each other, but during the fasting they became intimate with each other, what should they do? The answer is not in the Quran, it's in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, 60 days of fasting or feed 60 people. So when you break the fast, it's also 60. And when you break, when you talk to your wife this way, it's also 60. But when you break your word, it's 10. Now the question arises, if you break your word, now think about this logically, if you break your word, you, you made a promise to Allah and you couldn't keep it, you should pay with 10. And the qiyas should be that if you break your fast, which is like breaking a promise to Allah, you should pay with 10. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, not 10, but 60. Why? The only qiyas, the only equivalent of that in the Quran is this ayah. Why? Why, are these, why is the ayah about, the, about fasting, or the instruction about fasting, and the penalty for talking like this to your wife, why are they the same? Because in this case, your wife is halal for you, and you made her haram for yourself. And in the case of the fasting, eating or having intimacy was haram for you and you made it 
halal for yourself. So if only Allah gets to make halal and only Allah gets to make haram. When you take any of that, if you take the haram from Allah and make it halal for yourself, you pay the penalty of 60. When you take the halal from Allah and make it haram for yourself, you pay the penalty of 60. This is a matter of halal and haram. This is a matter of the hudud of Allah. Which is why the next ayat are tilka hududullah. Those are, the, those, are the, those are the limits, boundaries set by Allah. And by the way, when Allah talks about His hudud, what does He say in the same ayah? He says, وَلِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ For disbelievers, for kafirin, there is painful punishment. Ya Allah, أَيْنَ الْكَلَامِ فِي الْكُفَّارِ Where is, Allah was not talking to the kuffar. Allah was talking to the Muslims. The Muslim husband and the wife had a problem. But when Allah gives you rules and you don't respect them, then you are no different. You could think of yourself as Muslim all you want. In the eyes of Allah, you think this is small? You think this is nothing? To Allah, making joke out of this is equivalent to kufr. Which is why in the next ayah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُحَادُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ كُبِتُوا كَمَا كُبِتَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا آيَاتٍ بَيِّنَاتٍ وَلِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابٌ مُهِينٌ The people who oppose Allah and His Messenger, the, po- the people who resist the instructions of Allah and His Messenger have been humiliated. Like the people before them were humiliated. Now you, the people who do this are being compared to the nations that were destroyed. And they have humiliating punishment. You humiliated your wife, and now Allah is saying you have humiliating punishment if you don't make tawbah, you don't make this up. And then the ayah that I started with, the day on which Allah will tell you about things and you had forgotten all about them, but Allah remembered them, and Allah is witness over all things. Why am I saying all of this to you? I'm saying all of this to you because in the deen of Allah, the, the things we say to the people under our imara, when you're a father, when you're a husband, when you're in a position of responsibility, you have a lot of authority. And things in your family stay private. Nobody knows. Your wife is a good person. She's not going to go and talk to other people. You can have whatever opinion you want of her. They're not going to spill your secrets to other people. They're going to keep it inside the house. And when that happens, you feel like you have complete control. And some brother is going to come up to me after this khutbah, Akhil Kareem. You talked about the brothers. What about the sisters? (laughs) It's already running in your mind. Because you know what? When the ayat of Allah come, when these ayat came, do you see the Sahabi coming and running to Rasulullah saying, actually, Ya Allah, the ayat, Rasulullah, the ayat came, but you don't know my, my side. You know, she deserved it. Or she made me really... There's always two sides. But you know what? The ayat of Allah are not there, so you can say, but what about the other side? Stop hiding behind, but well, what about them? Right now I'm talking about me, and I'm talking about you. And sisters that are listening, don't use this on your husbands. This is between Allah and them. This is between Allah and them. And one day I'll come back and I'll get on you. You know? But you know what? Right now it's just these ayat. And Allah purposely didn't equate it on the other side. What about the women who do this, that? No, 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 no. Take responsibility for what you need to do. Stop deflecting. Stop putting it off. No, 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 this is an imbalanced picture. Call Suratul Mujadila imbalanced, are you? The surah itself is Allah's curriculum. This is how Allah taught us. What I really wanted to emphasize before I leave you, I know I'm five minutes over, I'll just take one more minute, is that in Surah Al-Mujadila, two-thirds of the surah is actually not about this issue. These are just the first six ayat. The rest of the surah is about people who conspired against the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Munafiqun. The Munafiqun. أَلَمْ تَرَى أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ مَا يَكُونُ مِن نَجْوَى ثَلَاثَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ رَابِعُهُمْ وَلَا خَمْسَةٍ إِلَّا هُوَ سَادِسُهُمْ وَلَا أَدْنَى مِنْ ذَلِكَ وَلَا أَكْثَرَ إِلَّا هُوَ مَعَهُمْ أَيْنَمَا كَانُوا ثُمَّ يُنَبِّئُهُمْ بِمَا عَمِلُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٌ Allah talks about people who make secret meetings to conspire against the Messenger وسلم, Some of them conspire to undermine his work. Some of them conspire even to kill him. Even to kill him. Now tell me, there are two conversations that are happening in secret. One conversation, people are trying to hurt the cause of Islam, to destroy Medina, to kill the Messenger. And on the other side, there's a secret conversation happening between a husband and a wife. And which of them was a bigger priority to Allah? Which came number one? The, co- the conversation between the husband and the wife. 
Ask anybody else if you don't study Qur'an, and which one do you think is a bigger problem? Marital issues or conspiring against the Messenger of Allah? Sallallahu alayhi wa You say, conspiring against the Messenger, of course. Nope, not to Allah, He's teaching us something. He's teaching us the entire purpose of this deen is to protect the integrity of the individual, protect the integrity of the family. And if you don't take care of the family, there's no point in protecting a community. Because all a community is, is a, is a healthy family, is a bunch of healthy families. The entire deen comes back to that. The entire story of humanity began with Adam alayhi salam, uskun anta wa zawjukal jannah. Go settle as a family. That's where it began. This is a priority in our deen. So that's mentioned first. And in comparison to that, even conspiracies against the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are secondary. What I'm trying to get at as I conclude, is that the way we think about what is the biggest problem of the Ummah? What is the biggest priority of Islam? What should all the Muslims be thinking about right now? How should they be concerned? These priorities, we don't have to come up with our own thoughts. These priorities have already been laid out and well articulated in the Book of Allah. We're not, just give, we're not giving the Book of Allah a chance. People like to quote an ayah from here and from there and from there, but they've already made up their mind of what is priority. I argue لِتَكُونَ كَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا The word of Allah should be supreme. What Allah declares supreme should be supreme. What you think and I think is more important is less important. We have to submit our priorities, our thought processes to the word of Allah. So he says the book of Allah, wa kalimatu Allah hiya al-uliya. The word of Allah is in the highest position. This, has, this is not just about ilm, it's about, it's about learning, it's about thinking the right way. I pray that Allah makes this ummah, one that thinks the way that He wants them to think through the book of Allah. Notice in the book of Allah, Allah does not complain, why don't you know, why don't you know, why don't you know. He says, afala ta'qilun, wa la yaqulu afala ta'lamun. لا 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 أفلا تعقلون لعلهم يعقلون لعلهم يتفكرون so they can think 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 you can have a lot of knowledge but you don't think Allah is teaching you how to think and so may Allah عز وجل make us a thinking people and may Allah عز وجل take make us take our family matters seriously because Allah is listening to every conversation والله يسمع تحاوركما Allah عز وجل is listening to every single conversation may Allah make the husbands of this community good husbands and the wives of this community good wives and may Allah make the husbands and the wives together give them the ability to raise good children that can carry the message of Islam the way that it's supposed to be carried may Allah عز وجل give us a strong sense of responsibility in every task that we carry and may Allah عز وجل make all of us successful before him on judgment day and not make us of those who overlook these things because they thought they were small only to find out on judgment day that they were big barakallahu li wa lakum fil quran al hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyyakum bil ayat wa dhikr al hakim Allah azza wa jalla is the one that's called him to it and Allah introduces himself to him and he's terrified because he's up on top of a mountain one of the things that i am a student of is language and how not just what Allah says but how he says it